going to be coming in with You Got It from Crystal Method. In the next segment, for obvious reasons, he's got astronauts in the background talking. Story Musgrave, with the most flight time of any American in space, only beaten by the Russian records. Uh, one of the main designers of Skylab, our first major space station. First to fly the shuttle, the only person to fly on all five shuttles. Medical doctor, psychologist, he's like seven degrees. Was back, he was in the Marine Corps in the early 50s. His brother died in the Marine Corps as a Marine aviator. Just such an interesting person, interesting family. And he's going to be joining us coming up. And you know, I don't know why he reached out to us. I haven't talked to him. I'd rather just do it live on air. But I would imagine it's because my show is well known to be very, very negative about negative things that are happening, but also very, very positive about the power of humanity and how we've got to go to the next level of a type one civilization off this planet to survive. And we've got to have goals as a species that are voluntary, but if they're powerful enough ideas, the majority of people will get behind it. We need an elite that's ready to empower humanity and build a technological system based around humans and life and the planet which go hand in hand. I know I was invited to speak at Oxford, and I said, what do you want me to speak about? Because it was the main Oxford group. I didn't go. I don't know why I didn't go. But, then I, and I'm not bragging it, but they said, well, we, we, some of the faculty, some of the people want to hear you speak about, you know, a positive view for humanity, your promotion of space. And it's not that I'm some expert on any of this. It's just an obvious gut level response, a genetic response of our species that's always trailblazing, always wandering, always searching, always innovating. The master builder species. And so Story Musgrave, I mean, other than somebody like Neil Armstrong, or maybe a Buzz Aldrin, there's, there's nobody more important at NASA. And uh, I just wish, when I was in Europe, Turns out he was in town and wanted to come in studio. So the next time he's in Austin or let's fly him out here, that's coming up. And I, and I don't know where to begin when he comes on the show. Uh, we've got all this other news to cover, but of course, Donald Trump's coming out basically in defense of Planned Parenthood now, you know, saying, oh, we should keep it open in non-abortion services. What, what does that even mean? And I'm not here to attack Donald Trump. I like what he's saying on a lot of fronts. Uh, it's just that we need to not just hold people up like messianic saviors. Uh, I don't like Bernie Sanders and his socialist ideas, but I think at a lot of levels, you know, he goes after the big banks. I want to think that he's at least for real so I can respect him, but not with statements like this. Bernie Sanders, criticism of Hillary is sexist, close quote. You know what? I don't criticize Hillary because she's a woman. It's very insulting to use mindless tactics like that when they know full well. This woman's involved in Benghazi. She's involved in Fast and Furious. She's involved in the foundation scams. She's involved in everything you can imagine. And we don't need political dynasties based on family names anymore. It needs to be on merit. Like Story Musgrave, who came from nowhere, but because of his skills, ended up being the top astronaut in the NASA program for decades. Just like Admiral Nimitz came from nowhere from Fredericksburg, Texas, but because of merit in the Navy, he became the head of the Pacific Navy in World War II. And, you know, this country became great because we really were, more than any other nation, people came here because of this. You were born in Italy or you were born in Russia, you were born in Japan. You couldn't go anywhere if you weren't in that class. America was about merit, and that's why people came here. And Hillary Clinton has been given everything she's got, and I'm sick of her. I don't like men like that. I don't like women like that. I'm tired of it. Americans like people that did it on their own, working with others, but had the initiative. And that's what we need to get back to if we're going to be a great country and a great planet. I mean, that's a no-brainer. I'm not saying anything that isn't already known here. It's not sexist to criticize Hillary Clinton. I can't believe they're going to use this in the campaign, but you knew they were. It was just a little over 100 years ago that the Wright brothers first had the first powered flight at Kitty Hawk. And now look where we are today. You can fly anywhere in the world in 20 hours or so. And so we think of space as something that really is unattainable, but it is attainable. And more and more we see moves towards only putting robots in space and building a technological world where humans are basically obsolete. 
But on the tip of the spear promoting humans in control of technology is Dr. Story Musgrave. And I won't go over his huge bio because it would take the whole hour we have with him. But of all the astronauts out there, we've had Buzz Aldrin on, amazing, one of the first people to walk on the moon, uh, and many others. Uh, I'm really blown away to have Mr. Musgrave on because I remember being a little kid and my dad watching Skylab on television and talking about how amazing it was. And he was involved in designing Skylab, one of the first people on the shuttle, the only astronaut to fly on all five shuttles. I know he was involved in a lot of other classified NASA stuff, a medical doctor, you name it. And of course, he doesn't want to talk about himself, but I, I mean, we need to celebrate role models like this doctor, this astronaut that we have on with us, Story Musgrave, because quite frankly, when we only celebrate Hollywood people or folks that can throw a ball in a basket, uh, it really skews the civilization. If you go back to the founding of this country that had the most inventions and the most innovation, it was all based on trailblazing. It was all based on challenging, uh, inventing. That was the culture then. Those were the rock stars, the icons of 1776, really the flower of the Renaissance. And so in this world where we give some of these corporate CEOs, you know, three, four billion dollar bonuses when they get government bailouts, we're told that we don't have money for NASA. We don't have money to go to space. Well, we've seen the private space program. It's very daring when I support. And we've seen the deaths and the crashes there. And so it is out there on the edge of that envelope, the right stuff that we find the men and women that really do exemplify the human spirit. And if we don't truly get a foothold in space, we're never going to save this planet. I believe we're meant to save this planet, but use it as a jumping off point to the next level of human development that we're so close to. Now, enough of me ranting. Uh, you can read his NASA bio at nasa.gov. You can obviously go to Wikipedia. It's basically the same thing. Uh, but Dr. Musgrave was selected as a scientist astronaut in 67. He'd been in the Marine Corps back in the early 50s before that. Uh, in August of 67, Dr. Musgrave participated in the design development of all space shuttle uh, activity equipment, including spacesuits, life support systems, airlocks, and man maneuvering units. And he was involved again in the, some of the first flights of the Challenger, all five of the space shuttles, uh, designing Skylab, being on Skylab. Uh, he spent 1,281 hours, 59 minutes, 22 seconds in space. He's the only astronaut, again, to be on all five space shuttles. Prior to John Glenn's return to space in 98, Musgrave held the record for the oldest person in orbit at 61. In 96, he became the only the second astronaut to achieve the record of six space flights. And he's the only formally educated astronaut with seven academic degrees. He retired from NASA in 97, storymusgrave.com. He's also a multi-time best-selling author and has flown in hundreds of different aircraft. Uh, and I'm going to stop his bio right there. Uh, not to, I mean, it's an interesting story. I was in Europe for two weeks reporting on the economic situation there collapsing Africa, and I learned that he'd been in town and had reached out to see if we could meet. And then we, of course, he's left Austin now, so we called him. He's on the show with us today, and I hope we can get him on in the future via Skype or in studio. But Dr. Musgrave, thank you so much for coming on the broadcast with us. Oh, you're welcome, sir. And uh, my biggest accomplishment is standing right here to talk to you, and that's my daughter, uh, Little Story Musgrave. Hi, Alex. Hi, how you doing? And she's nine years old, and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna let her go now. She's gonna go back to the tractors. So she drives tractors. She got her own ATV, and she drives 360 mowers, and she does that kind of stuff. She's getting the same kind of raising that I did. So she'll be she'll be ready for the rocket world when the time comes. Bye bye, sweetie. Bye. Okay, you weren't expecting that, were you? No, but it's awesome. Listen, I've done my little intro. Uh, obviously, the audience wants to know, what do you know about the info war and the broadcast? We're flattered that you're a listener, sir. Uh, what do I know? Uh, I'm not sure what I know. <laughs> <laughs> I've just been to your site and stuff, that's all. Well, it's good to have you on no, the broadcast. I haven't, I haven't heard the program, so is she, are you mostly an Austin audience? Sure, well, you were telling me you'd seen some of the videos online and stuff, but I was just curious about, I mean, I'm just flattered that you reached out to us. We're honored to have you. So, are you mostly an Austin audience? Uh, we're all over the place. Oh, it reaches further? Yes, sir. 
Well, I love Austin, man. Austin's a going town. Austin's everything. Austin's the future. Well, so they got the high tech, the beautiful geography, the beautiful people, the great ambiance. You know, it's the future. And so I got two kids that live there, too. Well, that's why we've got you on. You're somebody that can tell us about the future. Uh, where do you want to start? About the future? Yes. Where would you? I mean, there's so much to discuss. Well, there's some complicated things, and that's how complexity is arising. I know your audience can handle it. The complexity of Mother Earth is arising. And the complexity, of course, the advanced evolutionary string, which we are. In other words, biology is massively complex. It became that way. But then the silicon world, that world is becoming more and more powerful, more and more complex, and it's tighter and tighter in connections, interconnections between biology, that's us, and that world. And so you can look upon, <clears throat> and it's a painting I did for Intel. It kind of reflects that entire increase in complexity. But for starts, uh, that's one way the world's going. Well, obviously, I want to get into NASA. Um, what is... Summing up, NASA, where do you think it's going right now? I don't know where it's going right now because there's no, there's no even, there's no long-term vision and there's no short-term vision. Uh, so they need to get a vision, and so it starts everything, everything, whether it's a corporation or a group or a family, they need a vision for what they want the future to be and how to make the future, you know, and how to get on that plan and get going. So you must have a vision, and then you have leadership to the vision, and then you have to have what's called project management, which will make it happen. That's what it gets down to, not just for NASA, for every institution, every person, every family. What is the vision for the future? You get leadership that will communicate the vision, make it happen, and then <clears throat> project management is like systems. So project management looks at every single detail that needs to be managed and run to get to the finish line. That's what it's about, Alex. What was your favorite mission of all your NASA missions? Well, of course, I'm, I'm most well known for uh, being the Hubble repair mission, lead mechanic to repair Hubble. I got that, of course, because I'm a product of child labor and a teenage uh, marine aircraft mechanic. I drove tanks, tank mechanic, all that stuff. But that's the one that's most notable. But I, I didn't just go and fix it. I designed it for 18 years. So I'm, when I say I did these things, I don't mean I did them. I mean I helped. <clears throat> but I was the astronaut that was there to design Hubble for serviceability and maintainability. Starting in 1975, they told me to look after that machine. Identify every failure that it could get into, and there's hundreds of them. I am to identify the failures. <clears throat> and I am to come up with a spacewalking tools and procedures to fix it. So that's that. And after 18 years, I went to fix it. That's my best-known mission, but one of my most ambitious missions was uh, my second one on Challenger, and that was an astronomy mission. Four ultraviolet telescopes, infrared telescope, cosmic ray telescope, X-ray telescope. My goodness, we were that kind of observatory. So we were running an observatory. That was a massively, maybe the most aggressive mission NASA's ever flown. But it doesn't get so much attention. You know, it's, a, it's an observatory. But that was massively demanding. But when you ask me, you know, what missions do I get excited about, I get mostly excited about the missions I have to design. So I have to design a mission. So here's the job that needs to get done, and you and, and Mission Control design a mission to get that job done. Sometimes you get handed a very mature technology that's been flown before, and all you do is do the checklist. And the checklist is, is, is what switch, it's what rotary, and what's input to a, to a computer display. And then you've flown the mission. And so all you do is, is, like a monkey, learn on what page to be, what book and what page, what knob to turn, switch, and item entry to a computer. Sure, I saw a speech you gave, and you talked about, though, if you don't do these things right, people die. Well, I've been living that kind of game since uh, age uh, 16 when I soloed. I got to get it right the first time. I got to get it right every time. So I've had the privilege, Alex, of being on that kind of playing field. I've been on 100 playing fields. You go through life, that's what life is for everyone, not just me, you and uh, everyone listening out there. Life is an opportunity. So you look in the mirror today, this is my skill set. What is the intersection of the native talents? that I came into the world with and my parents gave me. 
what experience, what education have I had, and where is my passion? Number one, where is my passion? The passion guarantees you'll put the energy into what you got to do to get there. So passion is number one thing on where you go next. Do you have a passion? So you've got to have vision, you've got to have passion, and it seems like the culture that's promoted now, they're not really promoting vision or passion in individuals. Um, yes, because true passion is important, but well, everyone knows that. Why do but you think you, that is? You know Why do you that, think that Alex, is that we're not that. seeing uh, passion and and focus and goals really being promoted uh, by the power structure these days? It seems like there's not really a, a culture at oh, all. Oh, I see what you mean. The power structure. You're talking Washington, I guess. Yes. No, no. The passion doesn't play much of a thing. It's supposed to be logical and rational somehow. But, of course, you can be logical and rational and... Uh, and, and still have passion. But I guarantee you, sir, if any entrepreneurial company is going to get out the door, I guarantee you every person in that company is rabid with passion. You don't do entrepreneurial stuff and get out the door without it. And if you look at all the great companies, the great companies of the world, those people believe. They believe in that company. They believe in what they're doing. And belief means they're in the game. In the game. Story Musgrave is our guest. Um, wow, I mean, you've been on all five of the uh, Space spacecraft shuttle. that, that of course, well, wasn't it originally the space shuttle designed or, or a simpler version by Werner von Braun, or is that incorrect? He designed a lot of stuff, sir. Werner von Braun, who I knew very, very well. I met him, by the way, I flew the airplane by his window. He thought of someone different flying that airplane. He asked, he called the field up and asked, who's flying that story, Musgrave? Can you join me for lunch? From that day forward, whenever he saw an airplane flying that way, I had lunch with him. I knew him very well. But that's a guy, Alex, who, who, who read science fiction, so he believed. He believed from a teenager. He went to Herbin Oberth, who was the world's leading rocket expert at the time, he went as a teenager to that man to learn space line, to learn rocketry. And he did it as a teenager. Then, of course, he progressed through life. He got a Ph.D. in physics. He became a rocket person. And unfortunately, his country at the time, you know, Germany, his country at the time, wanted him to drop the twos on London. So serving his country, he did that. Not good, and he didn't like doing that. But he came to this country, and away you go. But the man was science fiction. The man was a dreamer. The man was one of the greatest visionaries we had. The man was incredibly close to Walt Disney and that kind of thinking. So uh, there you had it. You had a great visionary. Sure. I mean, didn't he pretty much invent cruise missiles, you name it? He came up with the idea for the uh, circular cities in space, the space yeah, shuttle. he did that. He had endless visions. He had endless visions for space flight. So the one you mentioned, maybe he had that vision, too. So he had space stations, he had Mars, he had all those visions, but we let him go after we got to the moon. The very year we landed on the moon, we let him go. And so we let go, really, the best visionary we had. How is it that they can't recreate now, they're saying, the Saturn rockets, and we have to use Russian heavy lifters in 2015? I mean, it seems like there's a yes, conspiracy sir. somewhere to sabotage American uh, space program. Yes, sir, I cannot, we cannot understand that at all. So the company, the greatest rocket company in history was called North American Rocketdyne, North American Aviation, and they owned Rocketdyne. And so, you know, when Von Braun said go, when he said, when we were told to go to the moon three years later, a Saturn lifted off. Now it takes us 15 years to develop a rocket. The Saturns never had a catastrophic failure, not ever. They took us to the moon. They took us where we wanted to go. So, you know, why don't we just do Saturns? They're 50 years old, but they're still better than anything we got today. But that is a critical issue, which is not being raised, and that's why are we all so unreliable with rocket engines. Now, General Electric jet engines, and yes, there's Pratt and Whitney, Rolls-Royce, and the rest, but I just want to be particular. GE jet engines are incredibly complex. They're incredibly powerful. When you get on an airplane and you're going from here to to here to Johannesburg, you're going to get 17 hours across the waters. Both engines got to work, and both engines always work, sir. Their reliability is in nine decimal places. 
Jet engines, the reliability is at nine decimal places. When you go to Austin there, you go to Bergstrom, get on an airplane, it's eight decimal places, anything bad going to happen to you. It's one in almost a billion, anything going to happen to you. So they have built reliability into that system, commercial air, including jet engines. They cannot do that in rocketry. They can't arrive at configuration, have what they're doing based on the pedigree process of earlier successes. In other words, configuration, live with it, best practices, and continuous improvement to unable to do that in the rocket world. And is that because they're always trying to start something new? As you said, build on what yes, we sir. know is reliable. We don't build on what we know, sir. We don't, we don't do that, and we don't have any way of capturing what we know. And a rocket engine, the people expect it to blow up. The last three rockets on the way to space station, three in a row, three in a row blew up. Yeah, it's sabotage. And so, well, I don't know. It's just a, it's it's ideation sabotage. It's just now, what are we doing here? You know, what are we doing? But a rocket is a chamber. Sure, when I say sabotage, I mean culturally from Washington, yeah. what's going on. Because, I mean, you heard my intro. If we don't have goals, you know this better than I do, if we don't have role models promoted to school children like you and others, we don't have any future. I mean, when my dad was a kid, his idols are people like you, other astronauts. Now, young people don't even know who Chuck Yeager is, who's a listener of the show, by the way. It's just crazy that we've gotten to this point. So I'm saying, how do we, as you said, Werner von Braun was a fan over 100 years ago of science fiction. So he envisioned the modern space system we have today that so much of our civilization's based on. And then now we see what humans can envision we can ultimately build. But instead, imagination's been taken away. So the technological elite that Eisenhower warned us about can quietly, on their own more secretive reservations, develop the technological world in the direction they want, while we're given a stagnated, uh, slow-moving technological development. That is my view of what's happening. Yeah. Yeah, sure. How do we break free of that story, Musgrave, uh, the American with the most uh, space time? It's called a vision. Build a vision. It's called build a vision. They can't turn down. That's right. But you know now, NASA does, are not interested in building a vision. NASA does not have a vision. They don't think it's their job, sir. NASA salutes now. NASA simply stands up and salutes the administration and salutes the Congress and tries to get the Congress to do what the administration wants done. NASA doesn't understand. The administration doesn't run the program. The only thing you get to do is what you got money for. And you can't do things you don't have the money allocated for. But the NASA no longer does the vision. They salute and they accept the role they're handed. And that's no money and no vision. When's the last, when's the last vision NASA came up with? A long-term vision or even a short-term vision? They don't do vision anymore and they don't think they should. Absolutely. And they have mainstream media put out the conspiracy theory and give it credence that we didn't go to the moon to also sabotage our worldview. When I have personal friends who were on the mission on the ground, like Raymond Teague, and he said we absolutely did go to the moon. And so putting the idea out that we didn't, what, I didn't fly to Europe uh, in nine hours last week? Uh, the, the Wright brothers didn't fly? My cell phone isn't more powerful than the most powerful computer 20 years ago? Of course all this is real. Yeah, I don't know. With, with, a, with a medium... Medium power telescope, you can see our our spacecraft on the moon. Absolutely, and we've you got the laser that. reflectors. Sure, exactly. The laser, what sends that laser back? And so, and Al Shepard, how come his golf ball went forever? And when Dave Scott dropped a hammer and a feather, and they fell at the same speed, hey, what are we talking about here? <laughs> we well, I'll tell you, I figured it out. There are elements in the government that actually put out the fake photos and the rest of it put it into the NASA material to create this conspiracy to kill the space program. It, it is deliberate, it's at every level, and it is to stifle human development, and it, it's, it's the Club of Rome. They've said openly they want a feudalist system where technology is frozen, Doctor. That's my view. I see. Well, I don't know Washington, sir. I, I've never worked it. I've had the privilege of not working it. I know you helped build NASA. I mean, I, you don't like to brag, but you—I mean—it says here, just no, in mainline it, literature, that you were in that you were a main innovator on the shuttle. 
uh, Skylab unanimity. Level. That's creativity from the bottom up, sir. I was a bottoms up person. I came from the bottom. You know, vision and stuff can come from the top or come from the bottom. I'm a bottom person. It's just where I am. Well, let's talk about your view from the bottom going all the way to the top. Let's talk about what it's like in space. Let's talk about some of your books. And let's. And, and I want you to guide the discussion when we come back. And I want to invite you. I'd love to fly you here. Oh, I forgot. That's a conspiracy theory. We don't have that technology. I want to invite him to walk here uh, by horse and carriage. Uh, Story Musgrave to Austin, Texas. Uh, he joins us right now via the telephone for radio and TV listeners. StoryMusgrave.com. A true American icon. So we're told by the social engineers that the age of humans is over. That the age of silicon is upon us. And the transhumanists, that is the dominant transhumanists, they're not all bad, basically say that humans are obsolete. I don't agree with that view. Humanity is amazing. We've done amazing things. And people like Dr. Story Musgrave are on the tip of the spear. Again, from a farm boy to the Marine Corps as a mechanic to, you know, seven degrees and being a science uh, astronaut officer in 1967 and having more space flights than any other astronaut in the United States. That's amazing. And we sit here in the middle of this universe, this wonder, this planet, spinning around the sun, way out on the edge of the spiral arm of the Milky Way galaxy, and we let the politicians and the infighting and the race baiting and the racist and all the distractions and the mainstream media diversions dominate our world. We have to transcend the globalist and have our own vision for humanity. And as our guest said, make the vision so good, people got to buy into it. Free will. And that's why there's a cultural dumbing down. Because the social engineers, and I've read their books, I've read their writings, I've had them on the show. They say if the general public ever gets into a culture of liberty, a culture of innovation, then it can't be centralized. Those systems don't go along with totalitarianism. And that's why we're told that we're failures and that we're bad and that we're killing the earth and all the rest of it so that we don't innovate. Dr. Story Musgrave, storymusgrave.com is our guest. Years ago, I read his autobiography, Story is the name of it, very powerful. And then, boom, here we are interviewing him, Story, The Way of Water. It is an amazing book. He's also got a book that I haven't read about the P-38 Lightning and what an amazing plane that is. And another one, Australia from Space. He speaks to some of the biggest conferences in the world. Amazing speeches and videos up at his website, storymusgrave.com. Uh, in the time we've got left with you in this hour, there's so many points I could raise, so many questions I've got. But when you do give a speech to, say, college students or high school kids or to whoever, uh, I mean, I know you have different speeches, different variants you give of those, but what is the most important overall point? Just the thing about culture and vision and goals uh, and trying to get them to think outside the box. I mean, I love what you're saying about innovation from the bottom up because that's how I started the interview because I've read your autobiography, but it makes total sense. This country was the greatest in the world because we were about bottom up and about merit. And I see more and more we're moving towards a system where it's not about merit, it's what group you're a part of via all this political correctness. Uh, Story, what's your view on the bottom up world from somebody who's come from the bottom to the top. Well, it's uh, it's the work it's the work ethic and it's passion and it's creating stuff. It's creating stuff in every day and it's believing in your company, believing in yourself. Now, while I teach kids this, and I'm massively uh, optimistic for kids, I teach them it's one step at a time. If you look in the mirror today, you say, "Who am I? What is the total skill set that I got to offer to the world?" Now you look at whatever opportunity comes your way. There's a few doors that are open and there's some that are closed. Well, you look at the doors that are going to open for you and you choose. What's the next mountain I'm going to climb? It's one little step at a time. And see, that's what I've said. As you've repeated, 
You know, I'm a farm kid, product of child labor. I never finished school. I was a grease monkey, then off the Marines, airframe mechanic, and it just kept rolling. I just kept doing one thing after another, building me a skill set until I could open almost every door there was. And so when you do that, it's just do something. It is do something, do it with heart, do it with passion, be mindful about it so that it adds to the skill set you got. And after a while, you know, you have acquired skills in multiple domains. You're looking at the synergies between the different disciplines you've worked, and that becomes magical. And so I think that's the critical thing. It's whatever you're doing now, do it with excellence. Master that thing so you carry that, you carry that skill forward. You talk about that point with life knowledge, life skills, science you've learned, where all the disciplines tie together, and it is magical. And what's sad is so many people you run into are not competent, are not uh, confident, and they really think they have no future when the world is just wide open to them yes. if well, they just start moving. Yeah, one step at a time. Take one step. Take one step and do it well, but do not work eight to four in some job you don't like and don't care about and don't give anything to, because you're not learning anything either, and you're not getting ready for the next mountain. What was the most beautiful thing, sir, that you ever saw from space? Well, I've got a hundred of those things, Alex, but i got to start with the aurora. The aurora traverses over hundreds, if not thousands of miles. It's pink and it's green, and it shoots up and down. It's almost like you're flying through it. It flows horizontal. And uh, outrageous colors and outrageous, outrageous motions. And so that's, that's one of the more glorious things. And the moon racing across the ocean. Purple lightning that travels horizontal for 100 miles. Uh, so the night, the night view is very different. But the day view is fine, too. The geography is beautiful. The geography of different countries, and you know the cloud patterns, the ocean patterns. So the window, the window is spectacular. I forget the astronaut. We've read the quote before. He was on the moon, looking back at the planet Earth, and just said that up there, it made all the silly fights and all the mindlessness seem so petty. Yes. And I've heard a lot of other astronauts say similar things, that if they could just see how small the world was for themselves, it would help people transcend so much of the pettiness. Yes, sir. Well, I'm not a pessimist, but that stuff didn't work. So Buckminster Fuller said, who was a huge futurist, as you know, he said, you know, once we get beyond ourselves and get out there and we take a picture of Sagan's little blue marble, from out there, we will be totally different. It will make us think about us all sharing that, that spaceship. Well, <clears throat> it turns out it was, uh, it was 85. It wasn't a human that took that first picture. It shows Earth, you know, as, as Earth and as a spaceship. But that didn't change anything, sir. So the pictures from out there did not change anything. Now, you do have the myth about you can't see... Uh, uh, the borderlines between countries, I can see every one of those because people have different cultural patterns, different building patterns, different agricultural patterns. And so it's very obvious. The line sure, I mean, take Hispaniola, which, of course, is Dominican Republic to the east and to the US west. And Mexico is the sharpest line imaginable. It's a totally sharp line. But now, so that was supposed to change the world, sir. Now, I'm not a pessimist. I'm not a cynic. There's 50 wars today. There are 50 wars. We have our own six or seven now, and we're growing. With the mil our military is entering a lot of other countries this week. But if you add up, there's 50 wars this week on our little spaceship. And we humans need to stop that, because if you look at the amount of resources we put into destroying civilizations as opposed to building them up, it's horrific. Exactly. And and that's why I was going there. The astronauts say that they get this sense once they're out there, but I think the public just looking at it, it's almost like it's not real. But I tell you, it really hit me this week. I've flown many times around the world, but flying back from Europe on a Dreamliner and seeing the edge of space, you know, seeing the curvature of the Earth, 
and yeah. realizing that I was flying from Rome to the United States in like 10, 11 hours, it made me realize how ridiculous all this is and how silly it is and how finite our resources really are. And if a lot of these robber barons don't allow us to innovate and stifle innovation, uh, I really fear for the future of the species. What is your view, Dr. Musgrave, uh, Story Musgrave, uh, astronaut of astronauts, uh, joining us if you just tuned in, what is your gut view on the future of humanity? I don't know. I do not know. So, but uh, I know about the concept because Olive, Stop uh, Olive Stapleton, in a book called The Star Maker, he was considered to be a science fiction writer, but he was so precise and so detailed that he's considered to be a philosopher. But he, in his imagination and in his science fiction, was able to <clears throat> do star travel. He visited 18 different planets. And he expressed those planets in terms of did they get their act together or not. So you see what I mean? Did what I call the advanced evolutionary string, that's us, we are what you might call, I don't call us intelligent. We're not intelligent, sir. We're the advanced evolutionary string. If you look at Earth from a billion miles, like Voyager, and you see it as Sagan's pale blue dot, no brighter than a star, and understand that there are 30,000 nuclear bombs in that little lifeboat, you understand we are not intelligent. That is not an intelligent thing to do. I agree. So, but we do it, and we continue to do it, and we think it's okay. <clears throat> but Stapleton, then, so you get this view from afar that says, is that planet going to get its act together? Is it going to get its act together in terms of all the species uh, getting in balance with each other, taking care of each other, loving themselves, and that's human to human and human to every other creature, insect, and plant there is. Sustainable behavior is the other thing. But we get together and we do a sustainable behavior, and we look after this little spaceship that we have. And I agree with all that. The problem is <clears throat> some of these corporate interests use all of our goodwill the sustainability they're setting up doesn't even help the planet. It just gives them more control. I mean, take genetic engineering. It's got a lot of positive things. I mean, you're a medical doctor. You know that. But if you look at the real studies, they're doing it haphazard. It's also got a lot of bad effects, just like a nuclear reactor can be good sure. or bad. And they just don't seem to care. And, and quite frankly, I don't see us as a species making it much longer. Whether Atlantis was real or not, I call it the Atlantis effect. I think we're rapidly approaching the point where we will basically destroy ourselves or have a catastrophic event that knocks us back into the Stone Age. Yeah, and so, but we're not responding to all the signs. So it gets down to what socio-political system do we need to have uh, amongst ourselves to manage the globe. And I think, you know, one way to do it is for all of us to buy into a socio-political entity that will be the leader of all countries. Uh, the U.N. was born to help in that regard, uh, but you know what I mean? The U.N.'s been kicked around so bad, I don't even want to use that term. But if all countries could buy into a socio-political enterprise, which would be the leader of the world, and then you know, and then you build a socio-political system in which people get along and they constructively build civilizations and sustainable behavior. So I guess why the question you're raising is what is the correct socio-political system to get that job done? So well, we've gotten rather complicated here, but I know the Austin community can uh, can understand. What sure, and folks all over the world. Well, I want to be specific. If you look at the Rockefellers, if you look at others setting up the League of Nations, setting up the UN, they sold the idea as a League of Nations keeping their sovereignty and freedom but working together. That is a wonderful goal. We obviously need to do that, especially now with nuclear weapons. Great point. The problem is it's been hijacked by multinational corporations that are completely cutthroat, that are monopolistic, and who are cheating, selling weapons while they claim they're trying to stop all of this. And so I think the answer is having a culture from the ground up, based on merit, based on innovation, based on 
free will collective ideas. They come from free will, but then they yeah. gain, as you said, collectivism through freedom to, to, to have vision so strong, as you said, it can't be denied. And then by our collective decisions, we ignore what the evil sociopaths and, and psychopaths uh, are doing and the direction they're taking us. I think humanity has abdicated over their 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 duty and has been sucked in by basically the Hollywood culture and so it, it is so tunnel visioned or so narcissistic into that that we're in danger of falling into the water. Yeah. Well, it's difficult. So, but yeah, it all started out just fine. It was a great idea, and it didn't get corrupted. Let me ask you this question. What? What was the scariest thing you ever saw in space or the scariest thing that ever happened? I mean, obviously, getting on top of one of those rockets, getting on top of that space shuttle with three rockets every time uh, is a daredevil event. You did it more than anybody in the U.S. Um, I mean, what was the scariest it, thing it, ever happened? Yeah, it wasn't scary, Alex. It was, I'm a professional, and I make a decision ahead of time. That's what I do in life. Uh, you know, I was on the only uh, flight to lose the engine after we got off. I was on. A, I had a launch aboard before we got off, where he let the engines on the pad and didn't go anywhere. I was on the only shuttle flight to lose a main engine after we got flying. But we had a checklist. We knew where we were going. We had mission control looking after us, so we did what we had to do. I've been very, very fortunate in the aerospace world to have good designers and good machines and good maintenance and good procedures. So I've been in the aerospace world now for, for 64 years. I sold 64 years ago. And, you know, I, I'm very privileged to have great teams looking after me. Well, well you've talked about some of the most beautiful things you saw. And I guess scary was uh, probably the wrong word. I understand you get committed, you know, kind of get in a focused uh, position that you've already made the decision to do this. Uh, but, and, so I guess I should ask, what was the most dangerous thing? And I think you answered it was when that main engine failed. Yeah, but that, that was okay. We almost lost the second one, too. That would have sent us to Spain, to Zaragoza, to land in Zaragoza. But, um, yeah, so the shuttle was more risk than I like to tolerate. I don't tolerate that amount of risk. So the, the risk there is about 1 in 50 you're going to get it. And so I don't, I don't like that. That's too much for me. So I, but you did it more than anybody else. <laughs> yeah, but you make the decision, sir. You say it's the only way I can get there and I belong there. I understand. So, I mean, it's a commitment. Well, yeah, it's a personal commitment. It's your own. Well, was it painful for you, obviously? What was the feeling when you saw Challenger explode? Well, it's, uh, you know, first of all, it's you lost your friends. It goes from uh, grief to anger. That was criminal negligence. So that was not a technological issue. It was criminal negligence. And so it goes from the grief of uh, losing people you knew. And I did. The, I was on Challenger's first flight. So I know you were. Story, stay there. We've got a break. We'll come back and talk about that criminal negligence straight ahead. Well, I told you they're killing the space program. I mean, anybody can see that, but Dr. Story Musgraves has been breaking it down from the inside. But don't worry, we've got plenty of Banker bailout money to, so Goldman Sachs owners can have literally 300-foot-long yachts at taxpayer expense. It's just ridiculous. And again, I don't like welfare, corporate welfare, but the innovation that comes out of NASA, that's a lot better investment than trillions in Banker bailouts. Uh, Dr. Uh, finishing up with the Challenger situation, and then I wanted to ha have you spend a few minutes of what you would do if you were, say, the president. Uh, I mean, I guarantee you the president could go out and sell an initiative for a Mars mission. You were just talking about how that's dead. Uh, you were talking about 300 Voyagers for the price of one space station. Uh, so briefly finish up on Challenger. We want to thank you for joining us. You said you'd come back soon. We look forward to it. And then spend a few minutes on what you would do with the space program if uh, you, know, you were uh, king. Uh, Challenge was just bad decisions. Uh, Challenge was micromanagement uh, from people from Washington that didn't know about launch and didn't know the technology. Challenger should have been up to left to the Launch Control Center where they know about launches and they know about technology. You can talk about engineering O-rings, but let's just talk about icicles. That morning, there were uh, four and a half long icicles. In, okay, you're not certified to launch. You have to look at the requirements you ask a system to perform. Under what conditions will it perform? 
And so were there any requirements put on the shuttle system that it would fly immersed in ice? There were not. So the system is not designed to fly in ice. And when you see 18-inch long icicles, you're not certified to fly. And that's a mature decision maker. That'd be like no. tying lead weights to the bottom of it. And so you just don't do it. You weren't certified to fly. And so it was micromanagement, you know, and they went ahead and flew anyway all with all the bad data. Now, what to do next? NASA needs to get visionaries and create a vision that is separate from the administration and separate from the Congress. It needs to be the right thing to do in spaceflight, short-term, middle-term, and long-term. They need to come up with a vision and then insist that the administration and the Congress both together buy into it. Here's the vision. Here's where we want to go. Now, but the administration, this administration, I'm not criticizing them, but they don't believe in space, and space means nothing to them. They don't participate in the space program. They are not there for anything. They don't participate in it, you know. And so the current administration in the Congress is not that passionate or enthusiastic about space flight at all. They don't support the team. Uh, so, but I guarantee need- you, they had like space bonds and, and all the technology that comes out of it, and they had like comic books for kids and stuff. You could yeah. raise, I could raise if I had the PR platform, billions and billions a year for NASA. It's so easy. People are in love with space. They know we need to go there. It's being yes, intentionally they killed. They do. The people are behind us. The people support us. Anytime you give them anything. But you do have to give them something. You have to give them space. Now, it was a huge strategic error. <clears throat> then we went with Space Station. It's the, the same price. We could have had 300 Voyager satellites. We could have had satellites on every planet, every moon of every planet, and sample returns from every planet for the cost of Space Station. <clears throat> you could have 300 channels. And you, which you could have today, every citizen could have 300 channels in which they select what multimedia they want from what planet or what moon of what planet. We could have covered the solar system with multimedia robots. That that's the vision we lost. Something's going on. We've got to have you back up for part two. StoryMusgrave.com. Story, the book on his website. Story, amazing. Uh, You're a true trailblazer, and you're the Americana story from the bottom up. We salute you. Uh, Have a great week coming up. We look forward to speaking to you again. That was terrific, Alex, and thanks so much for bringing me to that great public there. Thank you, sir. Great to have you. Okay, best wishes on the journey ahead, everyone. Thanks for having your daughter on with us.